All right. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm going to get started. Uh, I think we're going to fill up over time. It's interesting to me that with all the new protocols, we ask everybody to sign up. Um, and we actually were at capacity in terms of signups. Um, so I, the one thing I would say is tell your classmates if they sign up to try to actually either sign up and come or don't sign up. Um, but don't sign up and not come. I'm John Haig. I am the co-director of the Mosavar Romani Center for Business and Government. I co-direct it with Larry Summers. Uh, and I think most of you probably have a sense of who Larry Summers is, former Secretary of the Treasury, former President of Harvard, uh, now a faculty member who teaches here at the Kennedy School and also some undergraduate courses. Um, so I want to start and give you a little bit of background about the center and then in particular how it can affect Know what just happened? There we go. Um, if you think about what the center is about, it really is about creating value, if you will, at the intersection of business and government. I want to ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. Okay, so you are the CEO of Coca Cola, and Georgia has just passed some voting rights legislation. What's your obligation? What's your responsibility? What kinds of issues should you engage in as the CEO or not? Or let's take another tack. Let's talk about Hurricane Ida. We just had this devastating hurricane. It hit um, Louisiana in the south and then moved up and hit New York and New Jersey. What's the role of the government in solving that problem? And what's the role of the private sector? And how do you think about those issues? And it's kind of interesting because in another class, I teach a joint degree uh, class with the, um, with, uh, for the students in the joint degree with the business school. I teach a class often on corporate citizenship. And, you know, you read the U.S. government, for the, for the U.S., you look at the Constitution. What's the role of the government? form a more perfect union, to establish justice, to ensure domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, to promote the general welfare, to secure the blessings of liberty. Okay, well, and then you start, you're starting to see a lot of activity where you have people like Larry Fink from BlackRock, right? We see many governments failing to prepare for the future on issues ranging from retirement and infrastructure to automation and worker retraining. And he goes on to say, as a result, society increasingly is turning to the private sector. Is that the right answer? And then you go on and you get the business roundtables listing the importance of stakeholder capitalism. And they list you know, your important customers, employees, suppliers, communities. Is that just good business? Or do these corporations have an obligation beyond kind of just doing good business? And then you come to others like the economists. I, I always get a kick out of this. A healthy competitive economy requires an effective government to enforce antitrust rules to stamp out today's excessive lobbying and cronyism to tackle climate change. That well-functioning polity does not exist today but empowering the bosses of big business to act as an expedient substitute is not the answer. And Larry Summers even was quoted a couple times on, on these kinds of issues. It, was, it said uh, that uh, without an enforcement tool, the roundtable statement lacked teeth and that government was noticeably absent as a stakeholder. I'm wary. I worry the roundtable's rhetorical embrace of stakeholders is in part a strategy for holding off necessary tax and regulatory reform. And basically, if, you know, if, if corporations use it as an excuse, basically saying, if you're accountable to everybody, it's great because you're accountable to no one. Okay, and why am I bringing all of this up in the context of the Center for Business and Government? Those are the issues that we try to focus on. Those things that are at the intersection of business and government. And those are, those are issues that are becoming, in my view, more and more paramount. I need to give you a little bit of my background, not too much. Um, I actually have sat in your seat. 
I'm an MPP 1982. Uh, I stay, I wrote a PAE, I stayed for a year uh, and did some research after that, but then I was in the private sector for almost 25 years. Uh, I was management consultant. I ran at and I was president of AT&T's international operations. Um, and then I was senior vice president for um, uh, emerging initiatives at AT&T Wireless. And then we sold ourselves to Singular and I didn't want to stay and they didn't care. Um, and I left and uh, came back to the Kennedy School as the executive dean in 2005. So I've been on both sides of this kind of equation. And those are things that are going to be critical more and more in addressing the broader social issues and defining those roles. And again, that's what we focus on. Um, really quickly, we have four big buckets, if you will, of activity, achieving shared sustainable prosperity, issues of regulation, particularly around energy, environment, and technology, China, Asia, and the global economic system, um, exploring capitalism and the role of the corporation. What we're gonna do for the rest of this, and I apologize up front, it's not exactly the most, it's, it's stimulating, but it is a series of videos by different faculty um, talking about their work. We have 12 programs within uh, the center. Um, faculty are gonna talk through it, um, <clears throat> but perhaps most importantly for you as students, a few things to keep in mind of what we do at the center. Um, one, there is opportunity to kind of work with faculty, our faculty teach, and I would encourage you to look at their courses carefully and, and consider which ones would be most valuable to you. Um, there are research assistant opportunities and you just need to kind of keep tracking online, uh, either at the website or the daily, HKS daily, whatever, usually the RA positions are listed. Um, there are multiple RA positions. Some are for faculty, but we also have a very extensive senior fellows program. And a number of students in the past have worked for senior fellows and found it incredibly um, rewarding. Uh, and a lot of times the senior fellows are a blend of practical experience in the real world. And they're now doing some work kind of in an academic setting, but they have very good relationships and connections uh, into the real world. So oftentimes uh, students have found jobs after being an RA um, for a senior fellow. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, we hand out some awards and prizes um, and we have seminar. We have a number of seminars and events. I'd encourage you to keep an eye out and see what those are and, and we make them open to you and we give preference and priority to students. Um, study groups, our senior faculty and often our senior fellows will have a study group, which is not for credit, but it's oftentimes very interesting and, and uh, very accomplished people. And I'll just give you one example that I'm working on. We have three individuals, a guy named Tom Wheeler, who is the chairman of the F uh, Federal Communications Commission, a guy named John Sallet, who um, was the deputy attorney general at one point for antitrust in the Department of Justice, um, and Phil Verveer, who was also in the Department of Justice, but also uh, the US ambassador for information and communications in a global setting. So, and, and we're gonna have a couple of seminars over the course of the semester. Um, I encourage you, to, encourage you to think about those. Um, we have a working paper series. If you're writing a PAE, um, you can publish your PAE if you get a sufficiently high grade in our working paper series. Um, and then we have the B&G Professional Interest Council. We have our, we have our chairs here, um, and they're gonna talk a little bit at the end uh, uh, about the PIC. I would encourage you to engage with that. Um, so this is just an example. Well, not an example. These are all of our senior fellows, um, and they do just some really interesting um, work. Um, and if you just look across at George uh, Juliaraca, uh, financial crisis. George was one of the senior Greek ministers um, who handled the Greek financial crisis. I don't know how many of you uh, remember that, and he's working on that reading, writing about it now. Uh, Connie Friesen uh, is a new senior fellow who's working on um, China and the China's kind of shifting regulation of its tech community and the role of that Chinese tech community in the world tech community. So kind of really interesting. Uh, topic, Megan Green on working on, she's an, basically an economist by training, working on an inequality, income inequality, and the gap in wealth and how to address that. Uh, Joanna Petresco is a, a politician in, I think it was Hungary, 
um, but she is working on fledgling democracies and how to make them work in the integration of some business and, and uh, uh, political activities. So just a really interesting group. I'd encourage you to go on the web, look at them and see what they have to say. Okay, with that, um, I am going to turn it over. We're gonna start going through the faculty. Um, we'll start, uh, um, Linda Bilmes, I think many of you know, she does a budgeting course and I'm gonna turn it over. Do I have that right? What's that? Oh, Larry, yes, sorry. No, oh, thank you. Um, yeah, Larry, Larry is teaching right now, which is the reason he's not here. Um, and he asked to do a little video. So we have, we have uh, uh, some comments from Larry. It's hard to imagine a more exciting time to be involved with uh, issues of uh, business and government. We have a new administration that is committed to the most sweeping set of changes in, in the way our capitalist system operates that we've had in several generations. Whether the issues are antitrust and market power, whether the issues are environmental regulation and sustainability and climate change, whether the issues are public sector, private sector cooperation around uh, COVID, whether the, is whether the issues uh, involve the reform of the uh, way in which global taxation has taken uh, place, whether the issues involve the definition of the objectives of uh, public companies and uh, corporations, it's all up for grabs and on the table. And our center is Harvard's place for considering uh, all of that. We try to uh, put on uh, interesting seminars, invite exciting visitors. We enjoy the company of uh, a range of visiting fellows uh, each year. And we serve as a particular intellectual home for the group of students pursuing both master's degrees at the Kennedy School and uh, master's in business uh, administration. So I welcome all of you. I wish I could be with you. I look forward to meeting with people and I look forward to an exciting year and a year when we're all gonna be back uh, together and able to interact personally, which is something I've very much missed over the last 15 months. Welcome. Sorry. Yep. So anyhow, uh, I just have to remind myself to, that you're not the only ones here. There are people online listening as well. So with that, um, David, we'll go through a couple of the videos and then we'll come back and get uh, you and get Jane. And we'll start with Linda Bilmes. And greetings to the Kennedy School students and to my friends and colleagues at the Masavar Room. Romani Center for Business and Government. I'm Linda Bilmes, and this fall I'm teaching MLD 411M, which is a module. Uh, this is the introduction to budgeting and financial management, and we cover basic skills such as cost accounting, variance analysis, uh, revenue forecasting, the balanced scorecard, social equity budgeting, and capital budgeting, and basic tools for evaluating budgets and revenue structures. It's a short module, so it's six weeks, uh, kind of boot camp. I'll 
teaching it with a combination of tutorials, workshops, and um, online exercises. This course is also a prerequisite, one of the prerequisites for my uh, field lab course, which is in the spring, MLD 412. And this is a really fantastic field lab in which we work with communities throughout uh, Massachusetts and the country. Um, for example, on uh, we work with the MBTA, we work with Massport, we work with small businesses, and um, uh, we work on a lot of uh, conservation and environmental projects. We work on, uh, we will have a huge amount of very um, complex projects um, this spring related to the economic fallout of the pandemic and communities and that are struggling to get back on their feet and to figuring out uh, the fallout and consequences around housing, transportation, and other issues that require money. So um, overall, my interest is on how resources are allocated. I have done work in my career on war costs, on veterans costs, on issues related to the national parks and conservation, as well as to um, uh, research on the public service and um, uh, state and local bu budgets and, and government, which are some of my, my main interests. And I will be very happy to see some of you and, and meet some of you and hopefully have some of you in my classes in this coming year. Next, we have um, Mark Fagan, who does a lot of work on operations. I'm Mark Fagan. I'm on the faculty at Kennedy School, and I'm also a former senior fellow uh, at the center. I want to start with a question, and the question is, in the past 48 hours, have you experienced a poor service delivery. You went for a license and there was a long line. You went to the grocery and there was a big long queue. Or maybe there was just a confusing process. My guess is that each and every one of us probably in the past couple of days have experienced that. I want to eliminate that experience for you and I want our students, including yourselves, to do it. I teach a course on operations management in the fall, and our goal is to help you identify service failures, to diagnose them, to re-engineer them, and to implement them successfully. I also teach a course in the spring on supply chain management. It has become very timely in the COVID world, and I welcome you to explore that as well. And finally, a couple of years ago, I was bitten by the autonomous vehicles bug, and I now run the autonomous vehicles policy initiative here at the school. Since it's at least initially not likely that I'll meet you in the hallway, uh, please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be delighted to meet you and explore areas of mutual interest. Thanks and welcome. Uh, next up is Jason Furman. I think many of you know Jason was the chairman the Council of Economic Advisors in the second term of, the, of President Barack Obama, uh, and he is now a professor of practice here, obviously working on a lot of issues around Jobs Act, but he'll explain that. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Furman. It's great to have you get a chance to see me, and I really hope I get a chance to see you over the course of your time at the Harvard Kennedy School. I work on just about every topic in economic policy. I served in the Obama administration for eight years, ultimately as chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. Over the last year and a half, my biggest focus has been COVID, its impact on the macroeconomy and the policy responses to it. Early on, I proposed that the government send checks to everyone in the country, a suggestion that um, was adopted. I've been working with policymakers on additional things related to support for states, reforming unemployment insurance, and other changes, as well as trying to understand a set of complicated and unprecedented economic issues, like how much inflation will continue to persist after the transitory part has gone. 
In addition, I've continued to work on some of my other projects, including related to increasing competition and antitrust enforcement in the economy, working on the digital giants, and some of my policy ideas on those are being implemented right now in the United Kingdom, and better understanding the economic impact of budget deficits and budget uh, and debt. I teach a core class on international macroeconomics. If you take the international track, I'll see you there. Um, otherwise, I look forward to seeing you around the Kennedy School. Uh, next person is um, Bill Hogan. And Bill is not teaching. Bill has basically become research professor emeritus, um, but he's still somebody worth knowing and uh, potentially uh, looking for research assistance. I'm uh, Bill Hogan from uh, the Center for Business and Government here at Harvard's Kennedy School. I have worked for many years on energy policy, including with a, the namesake of the Center for Business and Government. My work for many years has focused on electricity market restructuring and market design activities. Uh, this has been going on in the United States and many countries, and the challenges of this work have only accelerated because of the green agenda and the rapid and dramatic changes in the composition of the electricity system. This system is a mixture of public and private activities, which very much speaks to the central mission of the Center for Business and Government. I look forward to seeing you here as we return from the strange COVID year. And I wish you all well with your experiences at the Kennedy School and the Mosafar Rahmani Center. Thank you. Um, the one thing I would say for Bill, um, He's pretty hard to miss if you see him walking around the hallway. He's about six eight, uh, and he's very very tall. Um, and small aside, uh, when I was here as a student, uh, Bill was one of my mentors. Um, so it is a small world. You never know how things come around. Um, we're going to do uh, David Keith next, but he got a call, and so we're going to switch and do uh, Dick Light, Richard Light. Uh, next. Uh, welcome to the Kennedy School. My name is Richard Light, L-I-G-H-T. My friends all call me Dick Light. And uh, I am a longtime professor here at Harvard. My field, my focus is on higher education policy within MRCBG. I'll tell you two I have just a couple of minutes, so I want to tell you about two projects that my colleagues and I have been working on. The first one, uh, which already has led to a first book, it's the following project. What is the fastest growing group of students at highly selective colleges? You're all sitting at Harvard. I work at Harvard. So I'm thinking places like Harvard, places like Stanford, places like Yale, places like Duke, Williams, Amherst. The answer is it's first generation in their family to go to college students. 10 years ago, Harvard had 6% first generation college students. Now, this year, in the first year class, just arrived like now, this week, last week, we have 20%. I mean, that's more than triple in just 10 years. That's a fast growth. Question is, how do you help those wonderfully talented kids some of whom did not go to the greatest high schools. How do you help them succeed at a demanding college? A key word for me is the word demanding. We've worked on that for four years, bringing together deans from Brown, Duke, Georgetown, and Harvard. We've had multiple meetings, a four-year project, and a, a, a book has already emerged. It's written by Rachel Gable, G-A-B-L-E. It's published by Princeton University Press, and it's called, uh, it's called Navigating the Hidden Curriculum. Anyway, 
Anyone who wants to know more about that, you can go to Amazon or go to the Princeton Press because it's already published. The second project I'll tell you about is one that I'm in the midst of right now. It's been going on at MRCBG for four years, and I think we have another good several years ahead of us. I've invited um, 30, so it's three zero, of America's most talented, younger, future academic leaders. It took me quite a while to you know, select them, choose them, invite them. There are so many talented people. But I'm referring now to everybody from faculty to administrators. You know, example, Dean of Admissions at Williams College. Another example, Dean of Admissions at, you know, some other terrific place. Anyway, that's in addition to um, many, many faculty. There are some Kennedy School faculty included, David Deming, Todd Rose. They're both members of the thing. Anyway, we have 30 people. We meet once a year for two days and we discuss emerging challenges to higher education. Topics include lifelong learning. What does that really mean? What can Harvard do with lifelong learning? Another example is helping students who come from under-resourced high schools. They're smart as can be, but their you know, high schools did not ask much of them. How do you help them really succeed? Maybe, maybe I'll stop there. The big point is higher education as an activity is pretty active. It's a small group of people. I work with several students and it, I hope you enjoy uh, knowing about it. So thank you for your attention. And um, uh, I look forward to meeting uh, all of you or many of you in person when public health conditions make that easy. So the one thing I would say about Dick um, Light, and you know, you may have, it may run through your mind, like what's the connection of what Dick does to the center, right? And if you think about, you know, one of the buckets we talked about was shared and sustainable prosperity. Human capital, what is it that drives economic well-being, economic growth? It's human capital and it's physical capital. And what Dick is really focused on at some level is the development of physical capital. And he doesn't talk about it here much, but there's a linkage to things like the future of work and how do you prepare people to be effective in a world that's potentially rapidly changing uh, in terms of the nature of skill sets that are required. So. That, that's the linkage. Um, I want to turn, David, um, if you want to talk about what you're doing, um, now would be a good time or we can wait. <laughs> Hold on, let me give you this so everyone at home can hear you. Happy to just talk. Sorry about the phone call. That was my aging mother calling and you have to answer when <laughs> your mother calls. Um, uh, so I worked on climate essentially my whole career for 30 years but a big range of different work. Uh, so I've done some straight climate science, climate modeling and building instruments to measure how the temperature changes. Uh, I did a lot of work on um, energy system decarbonization, particularly electricity sector modeling. So I have like, I think four or so PhDs that I supervise that did electricity, electricity sector modeling uh, related to what Bill Hogan does, I would say, looking especially at CO2 capture and storage and about how we adjust the rules of the grid dispatch to cost effectively decarbonize the electric sector. Uh, I've also looked a lot at wind power um, and more recently at, at solar power and the possibility of large scale solar hydrogen. Um, the thing I focus on the most now is solar geoengineering, the idea that humans might deliberately alter the planet to reduce uh, some of the risks of climate change. I think the way to summarize this is that we have to cut emissions Cutting emissions stops the planet getting warmer, but it doesn't make it cooler. When, when we bring emissions to zero, this, the problem doesn't start getting better, it just stops getting worse. If you want to lower temperatures this century, there are really only two things you can do. You can do this solar geoengineering, or you can take carbon out of the atmosphere. I worked on both of those in different ways. I, I'm thinking a lot about the trade-offs between them and now doing that using some integrated assessment economic optimization models, but also a lot of policy work between those two. Uh, and I really look forward to, to meeting more of you uh, and uh, thanks for being in the center. The one thing I would add to what uh, David just laid out is he is um, starting with one of our senior fellows named Wake Smith, a seminar series uh, talking about some of these issues. And I think the first session is today. Uh, 
Um, and next we have Jane Nelson, who has been here dealing with issues of corporate social responsibility for a very long time. Thank you. Thank you, John. And a very, very warm welcome to all of you here and everyone who's joining us online. Um, as, as John says, I'm Jane Nelson, and I direct the Corporate Responsibility Initiative here, which I established almost 20 years ago um, with our faculty chair, um, Professor John Ruggie. And at the time, John had just been the Assistant Secretary General to Kofi Annan at the United Nations. And with Kofi Annan had um, created something called the United Nations Global Compact, which was the sort of first time that the UN had taken international frameworks and sort of applied them to business and business responsibility. And I'd worked um, in, in the Secretary General's office preparing a report for the UN General Assembly, trying to make the case, picking up on John's point at the global level, um, you know, what are the risks but also the opportunities for the United Nations to work with the private sector to leverage the type of technologies that David was talking about, the, the um, your incredible logistics capabilities, the global reach of the private sector, but in a way that put you know, public interest and the public good first. So John and I set up the center really to research um, both from the perspective of individual companies, you know, what are the choices and the trade-offs, as, as, as John mentioned at the beginning, that chief executives and their management teams make at individual companies to identify and manage social and human rights risks and opportunities, and then you know, really try and leverage the opportunities for the public good, um, but also mitigate the um, ex you know, negative externalities. And then also, what are the opportunities for collective action, both you know, between companies within industry sectors, but also public-private partnerships to address some of the much more complex systemic challenges that obviously you know, no government or company can address alone. And our research agenda today sort of focuses on two work streams. One, business and human rights. Um, John was also the Secretary General's um, Special Representative on Business and Human Rights and developed the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, which has become the global standard um, for how business addresses human rights issues. And then secondly, we look at um, business as a partner in supporting the sustainable development goals. And to give an example, two sort of current um, efforts underway, I serve on a newly created um, Global Business Commission to Tackle Inequality, which is a group of about 20 CEOs from around the world looking at inequality issues and what business you know, should be doing in that area. And we're also very involved with the UN Food System Summit, um, looking at how not only food companies, but information technology companies and others can be addressing um, sort of more inclusive and sustainable food systems. And we do a fair amount of work on both um, energy coalitions as well as um, health systems partnerships. So always you know, very keen to engage with students. Um, we hope to run um, you know, this year a, a sort of a series of practitioner dialogues with the, with the PIC and um, other student groups, bringing um, your business leaders in to share some of their, their perspectives. Um, and hopefully we'll engage with at least some of you on research work and, and other opportunities. So great to have you all here and look forward to getting to meet you all. Um, next, we have Roger Porter. I don't know how many of you know Roger Porter, but Roger um, basically does a lot of work in the political and business arena. Um, he was, I think it was Bush one. Uh, he was in the White House um, as, I think, Deputy Chief of Staff. Um, may have been his role. Uh, my name is Professor Roger Porter, and joined with many colleagues in welcoming you to the Mosavar Romani Center for Business and Government. I am a longtime faculty member here, and like many of you, looking forward to the coming academic year. This year, I will be teaching two courses, uh, one in the fall, one in the spring. The course in the fall is entitled The American Presidency. It is a course about the US political system from the vantage point of the president and provides an opportunity for students to assess, among other things, how much power the president really has, the process by which we go about selecting and electing the president, uh, how the president manages his part of the government, the executive branch, the way in which presidents go about making decisions and making decisions on national security policy and on economic and domestic policy. The second part of the course looks at strategy and uh, the question of how presidents manage the transition from the election coming into office, how they seek to shape 
uh, the national agenda and how they manage their relations with those elements of the political system that are outside of their control, the Congress, the courts, organized interest groups, the press, and the public. And the final section of the course deals with the question of how do we evaluate uh, executives, including presidents, and uh, exercise um, appropriate judgment. In the spring, I'll uh, be teaching the uh, business government relationship in the United States. This is the survey course in business and government for those who are concentrating uh, in uh, business and government at Kennedy School and uh, students from the business school and the law school and other places are also welcome. Like all survey courses, it begins uh, by looking at the broad landscape of what's the, in the historical evolution of the relationship between government business and government in the United States, what it's like managing at the top of business, what it's like managing at the top of government, and the variety of ways in which uh, business and government interact with one another. Then we turn to the second section of the course, which deals with business and government and the quest for prosperity. We look at what are the elements of economic growth. Uh, we look at fiscal policy, tax policy, regulatory policy, uh, research and development, education. In each of these, we seek to look at what is optimal policy. If you were in charge and could do whatever you wanted to do, what would that policy look like? And secondly, how do we explain the policies that we have? What are the forces that go into play in producing the kinds of uh, policies that emerge in our political systems. The next part of the course looks at business, government, and the achievement of social objectives. And here we look at labor market policies, health care, environmental, and regulatory policies. And then the final section of the tour course deals with business, government, and the international economy. We look at uh, the ways in which uh, the United States is integrated with the rest of the world. We look at specific industries like the steel industry and the ways in which it uh, is undergoing adjustment. We look at trade policies and the use of trade uh, sanctions to try to achieve economic objectives. And we look at the future of the global trading system and what has happened and is happening to the WTO. So it's a, it's a broad survey course and it provides lots of opportunities for uh, students to learn across a broad spectrum of topics. We, uh, I'm also working with a colleague on uh, a volume that looks at state and local uh, pensions and the uh, growing challenge that they are experiencing and have been for the last uh, couple of decades and where this is heading and what can be done by state and local governments to uh, deal with this, what we call the gathering storm. Okay, next Jay Rosengard, who does a lot of work on uh, financial issues um, broadly, but also financial issues to some extent in developing countries. Hello. I'm Jay Rosengard, Director of the Center's Financial Sector Program. The Financial Sector Program explore, explores financial institutions, markets, and regulatory regimes, and our main focus is on financial inclusion, which is financial services for the unbanked and underbanked majority comprised of low-income households and family businesses. Some examples of our most recent activities include a study of mobile banking in Kenya, which has been completed and published, an ongoing study this summer of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on microfinance institutions in emerging economies, and something we're planning for this coming January, which is a new online executive education program for the United Nations Capital Development Fund on financial services for migrant workers. For that last activity, we're looking for teaching fellows, mainly to help with the asynchronous activities, the group work of the participants, where they deal with their own challenges. So if you're interested, let me know and I'll put you into the pool of applicants. 
I also teach public finance at the Kennedy School, and this fall semester I'll be teaching public finance and theory and practice, Dev 210. It has no prerequisites, no economics or uh, statistics prerequisites, so everybody is welcome. It's case-based, it's very applied. My area of specialization is Southeast Asia. I'm the faculty chair of the Harvard Kennedy School Indonesia program and the director of the Harvard Asia Center's Thai Studies program. So, whether you're interested in financial inclusion, public finance, or Southeast Asia, please feel free to reach out to me. And although we're physically very far apart, the center is still a tight-knit nurturing community and we'd like to have you join us. Thank you. I'm Sarush uh, Sagafian. I don't know how many of you know Sarush, but he's a relatively new faculty addition to the center. Um, Sarush does a lot of work on data analytics, particularly in the um, healthcare sector. Uh, Sarush. Hello, I'm Professor Sagafian. Um, I'm, I'm the director of the Public Impact Analytics Science Lab at the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, I'll be teaching API 222, which is machine learning and big data analytics this fall. Um, I am an operations researcher and I do a lot of work on uh, the general area of analytics and specifically my research is on healthcare. Uh, in terms of the class, um, as you know, in the last couple of decades, the amount of the data that has been available to organizations has uh, significantly increased. Uh, the class uh, that I teach provides a unique opportunity for students to learn and uh, apply some of the most popular machine learning and big data analytic techniques uh, to different problems. The course is designed specifically uh, to introduce to students the ways in which these techniques are applied to uh, practical policy making and decision making problems to solve some of the most difficult and most challenging societal level problems. So in the class, I have three goals usually for, for my students. Uh, I want them to learn uh, and have a basic understanding of the statistical theory underlying machine learning techniques. I want them to have an understanding of when and how to apply some of these techniques to uh, policy making and decision making problems and also have the ability to use software and work with actual data sets, uh, try to uh, solve again policy questions and decision making problems. Uh, the course has been very popular in the past with the students both from MIT and uh, Harvard taking the class uh, from different programs at HKS, but also different programs at Harvard, different departments at Harvard. And I hope you can uh, take the class as well. Uh, it, and uh, I want to mention that some of these techniques that we teach in the class are being used now everywhere, uh, starting from your cell phones. If you look at your cell phone, they are full of this algorithms that we teach in the class, but they are also being um, increasingly used to solve societal problems that we couldn't solve before. And we'll see in the class what I teach is mostly applications on different societal problems from healthcare to education, to social justice, to energy, to finance, uh, etc. cetera. Um, I hope I get the chance to meet all of you. Thank you. Uh, we have two more faculty, Malcolm Sparrow, is next and Malcolm does a lot of work looking. Malcolm was a former uh, detective actually in Scotland Yard. Um, and he does a lot of analytical work, uh, data related work on managing crime and other kinds of uh, social problems. Uh, hello, my name is Malcolm Sparrow. I'm uh, delighted to join all of my colleagues in welcoming new uh, crop of students to the Kennedy School. Um, you will have the most fabulous time. Um, I actually joined the faculty way back in 1988. Um, so I've been here now um, 32 years, uh, if I, my mathematics is correct. Um, but before that, I was a police officer working in the British Police Service in Kent. Um, and I came to the school in the first case as a mid-career student in uh, 1985 and graduated in 1986, at which point the school decided that they uh, thought I belonged here on the faculty. Um, so when I came, um, it was obvious that I should work on police management and strategy, and there's plenty going on in that field at the moment. Um, but I also uh, started working with other regulators too. I worked with tax and environment and then occupational safety and customs. 
Um, and before long, uh, the subject that I have pursued for 30 years is the work of regulatory practice. So I work most of the time in executive education uh, with practitioners, senior practitioners from a whole range of regulatory and law enforcement and security and intelligence organizations from all over the world. I'm very happy to be affiliated with uh, the Center for Business and Government and the Regulatory Policy Program. I have one problem with them. It's called the Regulatory Policy Program. And my focus has always been regulatory practice uh, because I believe that once the law is in place and once the policy has been set, there's still an awful lot of decisions that can be taken and that regulatory practitioners inhabit the space between the state of the law as enacted and the quality of protections as delivered to uh, the public and to society. Um, so I made this point last year, I'll make it again. Uh, I think that the program should be called the Program on Regulatory Policy and Practice. Um, I'll make the same point next year if necessary. Um, what that does mean is I'm very happy to meet with uh, anyone that's a regulatory practitioner um, and to talk about your own experience and the uh, range of uh, difficult choices that you have to make in these times. Um, and again, welcome to the school. And the one thing I would say is Malcolm is being a little bit tongue in cheek because he knows from my experience in the private sector uh, that I've seen brilliant strategies written which are basically ultimately incredibly flawed simply because they could never be enacted by the institution that they're being given to because they lack the processes or the culture uh, or the uh, uh, organizational capacity and structure to deliver on it. So. Uh, I don't disagree. Just so you know, I don't disagree with Malcolm. I think they have to all be linked. Um, with that, the last faculty member is Rob Stevens. Hi, I'm Rob Stevens, the A.J. Meyer Professor of Energy and Economic Development. I'm an environmental economist, and most of my work over the past 10 years or so has focused on climate change economics and policy. I direct the Harvard Environmental Economics Program, which is housed here in the Mosavar Rahmani Center for Business and Government. Uh, the mission of this program is to bring economic analysis to bear on pressing environmental, energy, and natural resource problems and issues. We have 30 faculty fellows from across Harvard, six associate scholars from MIT and Tufts, and 25 PhD students from four doctoral programs at Harvard. I hope you'll check out the website of the Environmental Economics Program to learn more about it. I also direct the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements, which is a joint initiative of this center and the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. Uh, the mission of the project is to help identify the key design elements of a scientifically sound, economically sensible, and politically pragmatic international policy architecture to address global climate change. We draw upon research and ideas from leading thinkers around the world, from academia, including economics, political science, law, and international relations, from private industry, NGOs, and governments. We have 80 research initiatives in Argentina, Australia, China, Europe, India, Japan, and the United States. And we carry out very intensive and extensive work at the annual climate negotiations and many other venues. I hope you'll check out the website of the Harvard Project on Climate Agreements for more information. In terms of my teaching, I teach three courses, API 135, economics of climate change and environmental policy in the spring of each year, and I hope I'll see many of you there. I also teach API 905 jointly with Jim Stock in the economics department. That's a PhD level seminar in environmental economics and policy. And no matter what level you're at, you're certainly welcome to audit the seminar. And then finally, I host and teach an executive program on energy and climate change policy, sometimes twice per year. My other major responsibilities at the Kennedy School include being chairman of our PhD programs and co-chair of the HBS HKS joint degree program. That's a joint degree program 
between our Masters in Public Policy, our MPID program, and the MBA program at Harvard Business School. So thanks, good to meet you, if only virtually, and I look forward to seeing many of you in person. So um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna, um, I just wanna introduce real quickly, the person who's masterminding a lot of this, Victoria Groves, um, uh, and you should, Cardillo, and you should know um, if you have an issue, you can talk to Victoria. Um, another person is Susan Gill, who oversees our senior fellows program, okay. and you can reach out to her. Um, and Matt Murray, who can help you with research needs tied back to the center. Um, and then I do want to introduce Claire Byrne, who is basically runs my life. So if you ever want to talk to me, you can just reach out to Claire and she'll find a way to get you on my schedule and, and we can have a conversation. Um, and if we have time, we'll come, come back to that. I do want to introduce the pick leaders. Um, they have a, a little bit of an introduction. Um, and it's Malika and, and Shikar and I will leave it to them to fill you in on ways you can engage. Thank you, Professor Haig. Uh, good afternoon and uh, afternoon to all of you on Zoom. Uh, I'm Shrikar, I'm a mid-career Mason fellow and Malika is also a mid-career Mason fellow. And we are here on behalf of the Business and Government Professional Interest Council, which is a student uh, body uh, interested in the intersection of business and government. And um, you know, we are basically the co-chairs of the council. And uh, we're here basically to uh, talk about the council, its its planned program, and uh, we're really excited uh, and thank uh, Professor Haig and, and the team at the center to kind of have a discussion with us and see how we can uh, have a program for the year for the, for the students and also kind of get uh, input back from the students uh, so that we can have an eventful year of events. So we have, um, uh, we have a, I think the, yeah, so, so we, we have a kind of a team assembled and pretty happy that we could, a lot of faces there, but we pretty happy we could get this assembled in, in a month. Uh, so, and most of the areas of interest that the, the center spoke about is, is what the council is here to kind of uh, organize and, and uh, explore. Uh, and um, so apart from us, we have uh, Kent and Kent is a communications director and Yomna is a finance director. And uh, as you see, it's a mix from from all all courses uh, at at Kennedy School. We have mid careers, we have MPP, MPA, MPIDs, and uh, the broad range of uh, topics is basically uh, the belief that business and government have to solve problems together, and uh, and the collaboration is essential. So uh, we do have uh, you know uh, areas of interest identified, and and uh, and and students who who have worked or who have interest in it, who want to organize events around it. Um, so we have, for example, uh, innovation, tech, and government. Uh, Stephen, uh, corporate social responsibility, and pr probably they'll be working with you, Professor, to kind of uh, get ideas on how we could organize some events around that. We have Hugh, who is working on healthcare, um, who wants to uh, explore that area. Uh, Ashley on public-private partnerships. Uh, Cappy and Jonathan on impact investing, uh, and 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 all its facets. Um, Grace Lamb and Amelia on sustainability and climate change and Gopal on international trade and investment. So I think our aim is to, with a series of events over the year, uh, explore these areas, get the best uh, minds on it to discuss with, with students and also get your feedback on what else we could do. So I think that I'll stop with that and like you could add on with the next. Thank you very much, Rika. Um, so we just want to very talk, talk very quickly about what our focus is going to be for this year. Um, we've picked two main sort of like areas. The first one is going to focus on knowledge development and thought leadership, obviously at the intersection between business and government. Um, we are going to have a series of events that are going to be led by the PIC leadership and the areas that they're focusing on from panel discussions to potentially book reviews, field discussions, um, event briefs. Um, we're interested in doing an event brief on the Davos WTO Ministerial Conference and COP26. Um, we also want to do spotlight events from um, conversations with alumni, um, faculty members, fellow from the um, Business and Government Center, as well as having companies that we think would potentially be um, of interest to, to, to the members, to our members. Um, we're also keen to have networking events. And just to let you know that these recommendations came from two 
things. The first one was a survey from the members where they said these are the kind of things that they wanted. And the second one was based on the sort of like applications that the leadership had, which essentially was suggesting events that they think would be relevant for the specific areas that they're focusing on. A core thing that we want to leave as a legacy, as a pick leadership team is a career um, development um, club. Um, and this again comes from the needs that we've identified. One of those areas would be f focusing on consulting careers. We've seen that there's a huge sort of demand for support with consulting, management consulting, and people who want to get into that field of work. And so we would be creating a buddy system um, that allows people to work together to do cases, et cetera, and also bringing in mentors that will support you from time to time with um, um, going through the recruitment process. A second thing we want to do is meet the recruiters and based on sort of like the demand we see for the kinds of jobs that people want, we'll be working with the Office of um, Career Advancement to invite some recruiters to come and talk to you about what it means to work with and work for them. And finally, we are looking at something we are calling demystifying careers with alumni. So alumni that we think um, based on the demand that we see, um, seeing how we can get alumni to really talk to you about what it means to work in these organizations, i.e. the ideal versus reality. Um, and um, if you want, are not yet part of the PIC, the, we have two ways you can participate. You can scan this QR code and um, register to be on our mailing list where all the information will be shared across to you, I think, bi-monthly. Bi and secondly, we also have a WhatsApp group, which you can also get access to in our newsletters. And finally, tomorrow we have the student fair where we will be sharing more information on some of the planned events that we have. Um, so please come through and meet the rest of the peak leadership team and ask them questions specifically about what they plan to do for the rest of the year. So thank you. So I want to thank Malika and, and Srikar because I think the PICS is off to a fantastic start, better than many, in many prior years. Um, and we will work closely with uh, the PIC to try to make sure we're kind of filling some of your needs and requests. Uh, just a couple quick examples of things that they were talking about. Um, one is um, a person named Marshall Lux and I are probably going to do a session. We're working with the career office on consulting, right, and consulting interviewing. Um, and how to think about that, how to do case studies, things like that. Um, the second is our senior fellows are going to be here next week from the 22nd through the 24th. And one of the things that we try to do is, this is probably an inappropriate name, I call it speed dating, um, where they sit there and you can go around and talk to all of them and draw on their experience and, and get advice uh, and counsel from them, uh, but just as examples. So. We are ending right at one o'clock. Um, the one thing I would say is I will stay around. I'll be here um, because I imagine some of you may have questions um, and I'm happy to stay for another 15 minutes or so uh, and answer questions that people may have. If not, that's fine, but, but just so you know it's here. Otherwise, if you need to go, uh, feel free to, to head out. And thank you very much for coming. This will be another strange year, but at least it's a strange year where we're here in person, uh, even if we have to wear these masks, uh, which I understand, but I find frustrating. Um, so. And thank you to everybody who has been watching on um, uh, Zoom. Uh, I sometimes forget that you're there, but I really appreciate uh, you joining us. <laughs>